Hey everybody, and welcome to the second episode of my podcast. If you want to know more about me, my story, and why I want to start a podcast, you can check out the first episode. In this episode, we're going to talk with Alex O'Connor. Alex is the founder of the Cosmic Skeptic YouTube channel, podcast, and blog, which is platforms dedicated to the publication of philosophical ideas and debates in an accessible format. Alex is a recent graduate of philosophy and theology from St. John's College at Oxford University, and Alex is an international public speaker and debater. His online videos have been collectively viewed over like 50 million times, attracting over 450 people to subscribe to his regular content. And he has also produced videos with notable experts in respectable fields, such as Peter Singer, Richard Dawkins, Bishop Robert Barron, and William Lane Craig. And Alex is an impassionate animal rights advocate and religious critic regularly regularly discussing these topics on his online platforms and he's also an enthusiastic reader and book collector and a musician and i should also mention that this is the first episode ever that i recorded with a guest and you'll maybe notice that i'm a bit like nervous and that the sign of my microphone is not the best but this is a learning journey um and i'm happy that i can learn new stuff all the time and the floor is anyways alex and it was really nice talking with him. So I hope you will enjoy it. Here is the conversation with me and Alex O'Connor. Hey, man. Hey. Thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. It's really great. appreciate it. I like being in Norway. It's, <laughs> it's my first time here. It's a shame I don't have more time to see the oh. place, but uh, you got lots of trees and lots of rocks and things like this. <laughs> well, yeah, I can probably show you some outside after this. <laughs> Could be fun. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so... Oh, I have so many questions for you, like so many things I want to ask. So I'm really curious to see how how much we can go through today. I really wanted to invite, invite you on because I really like how you think, basically. I've been watching like a lot of your content and stuff. So what we're going through today is basically like, yeah, like some stuff which I'm just really curious about. Uh, so to start off with everything that you have been through, what do you think are like some of the most effective ways that we can like help the world improve? Well, uh, it depends on our metrics for improvement. Uh, it's going to depend on on your ethical views about what what the good life is, um, but I think that, uh, of course, I've advocated for a long time that we should be uh, more considerate of our ethical treatment of non-human animals. Is one of the primary things that I focus on. The reason for that is not so much that I think it's the most important ethical issue. It may well be. It might not be. It's a hard thing to quantify, but it seems to be something that isn't being focused on at the moment. And so as an individual, in terms of your uh, effect that you can have on the, on the landscape, picking an ethical issue that is going to make a big difference, but also one that isn't being talked about, if you can find a balance between these two things, I think you're onto a winner. So sure, you could say that I'm going to contribute a lot to the world by becoming an environmental campaigner or something like this. And you probably will, especially if you're in a position where you have an audience and you have some influence. But as an individual, if you're talking to your friends or attending a protest, the likelihood is that most people are already at least familiar with this idea. And so the ratio of importance to your individual impact is actually going to be quite low. Whereas if you talk to people about factory farming and why this is particularly a problem, uh, even in an environmental context, then you're going to have a much higher impact because you're going to be one of the only people talking about it. Mm. And so the question is sort of what can humanity do to best bring about a an ethical outcome uh, is difficult to answer, but as an individual, you would just want to be talking about the things that most people aren't talking about. Okay, so that's like, yeah, what's most like neglected? Yeah, so, on, so for me, I found that yeah. the, the issue of animal ethics was a terribly neglected area that was a, mm. a good place to start. But uh, while well, we were just talking about William McCaskill's new book, who mm. uh, writes about future people and, and what we owe to them, and mm. they're certainly a neglected ethical category, mm. uh, future individuals who don't exist yet, People think about that in the long term and uh, in the environmental discussion, they say, you know, think of our children kind of thing. But we don't spend a lot of time really seriously considering the billions upon billions of future people who are going to exist. And so for William McCaskill, he'll see this and think, well, OK, there's something that needs to be focused on because basically nobody's talking about this. And that's why he's having quite a large effect, even though it's quite a niche mm. subject area, because he's one of the only people talking about it. And so I think it's about finding an ethical issue that you care about that is sort of unique to you that you're able to 
convey better than anybody else that you know. Do you know some ways like people can do that? Like how 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 do you figure out what's neglected or like what world issues should should I work on? That's a that's a bit harder. Um, I think reading widely is one of the one of the best ways to to do that. Of course, uh, trying to stay on top of the news and seeing if there's an area that you think isn't being talked about enough. Mm. Um, you'll often see stories being relegated to the back of a newspaper, but they'll, they'll be there. But maybe you think that it's not getting the attention that it deserves. Uh, and so, so for example, if you were a if you were a, a somebody who had a, a vague idea about animal ethics, you might read a story in the newspaper about some factory farm expose or something, but it might be right at the end, right in the bottom, and you just think to yourself, there's something important that I think is actually more important than it's being given credit for. Mm. And so you end up um, reading that and thinking, okay, there's something I could be talking about. Mm. Um, it's, difficult, it's difficult to say, really. Uh, it's, for me, I came across animal ethics because I finally decided to read Animal Liberation by Peter Singer. It had been sat on the bookshelf for so long, and I finally thought, look, I'm just going to read this as a point of ethical interest. If I hadn't just been broadly interested in ethics generally and just trying to read as widely as I can in that area, I never would have discovered it. And so I think it's about not just studying an ethical issue per se, but studying ethics more broadly. Mm. Similarly, if you want to talk about uh, environmentalism, you might just want to take an interest in science generally so that you have a better grasp of environmental science and areas, other areas that might be impactful there. Um, so it's, it's important not to be issue centric, but rather to study a broad subject area and use that knowledge to inform specific subject areas. Like listening to podcasts, for example, is also like one of my favorite ways to like figure out what's important now, like what what are people talking about, and like before studies come out and so on, you can also like talk with like scientists or listen to like what the current research is and so on, uh, and like with the book and so on, like you mentioned with Will William as well. Yeah, I'm also currently reading it. And by the way, uh, all the things we'll talk about, I'll put them in the like description or something so people can like easily find the stuff. Right. Okay, so for the whole conversation, I think we can have in mind that like we're trying to figure out like uh, how to like improve the world and so on. Um, but so to a totally different thing, um, wearing suits. <laughs> uh, like <laughs> when I was like deciding to uh, have this podcast, Mm, like one of my favorite like podcasters are like Lex Friedman and Andrew Huberman and um, I've just like seen like especially Lex Friedman with like his like uh, just like yeah suit <laughs> yeah tie and everything <laughs> tie and like everything yeah it's um, kind of good and I heard him say that he kind of wore it to like also show respect to his listeners and so on and um, so my question is for you like yeah like why like what 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 do you think about like wearing suits why do we wear suits right now because we look so good in them don't we <laughs> i hope so <laughs> it's a, quite a safe option for me um i decided a little while ago that every time i'm doing any kind of talk i'll try to wear a suit um of course giving a talk later today which is one of the reasons that i'm that i'm dressed up i don't usually dress in a suit just to do a podcast uh but you know having said that uh you know my my friend Chris, I was on his podcast, the Modern Wisdom podcast, and he, uh, I, I was in Austin with him and I was sort of doing a bit of a speaking tour around a few parts of the United States and I went to visit him and I'd, I'd packed for a speaking tour. So I was wearing suits, I had shirts and trousers and then Chris invited me to go to a boat party and I thought that sounded great. Uh, but the only clothes that I really had was a suit. So I, I had some swimming trunks on underneath, but I showed up in this in this shirt and trousers. And yeah. he kind of won't let me live it down. That, that He thought that me showing up to a boat party in a suit was the kind of archetypal example of the kind of person I've become, which is just wearing a suit anywhere that I possibly can. Um, but it's a safe bet. And it it does signify, as, as Lex Friedman says, which I didn't know he says that, but it makes sense that it shows a sense of respect to your listeners and to your guests as if to say... Mm. This is this is work. This is something I'm taking seriously. Uh, suits are designed to be that kind of clothing. They're designed to be the kind of clothing that you can put on to say, this is just straightforward business, and you know we're not gonna we're not gonna play around. We're we're just gonna put on something that says we're here to do something important. We want to be taken seriously, and I think suits are a great way of doing that. It has a psychological effect on people. If you walk around wearing a suit, even just going about your daily business, people treat you differently. 
strange. They'll treat you with, with more respect, with almost a bit more deference. You know, people mm -hmm. will be politer to you. It's a strange psychological effect that it has on people, but I think it can be a beneficial one. Yeah. And also, like, I mentioned that, like, this is work. And also just to, like, really uh, say it clear that, like, the reason, like, why I really want, like, uh, talk with you and like have this podcast to talk with people is to like try to better understand like how we can improve the world and that is like yeah serious stuff man <laughs> mm. wearing suits is a good way to start if everybody I... wore suits what a wonderful world it could be <laughs> that would be funny yeah like usually i uh, like wear hoodies and stuff and so on so when we met like the people in breakfast here uh people were like yeah like oh wow like you, <laughs> you look nice bro yeah well sometimes especially yeah. in a in an environment where you're speaking at an event you might be the only person wearing a suit uh, yeah. i i went to a, a a festival a literary festival in wales earlier What's in the literary year literary festival or uh, like a West? kind of a book book festival speakers this kind of thing yeah. and it was middle of summer in a big field and everyone was camping because I was speaking at a few events, I was wearing a suit, but I was just sort of walking around like an attendee because I wanted to go to some of the talks and, and stuff. And everyone's wearing like shorts and t-shirt because it's blazing sun and I'm, I'm walking around in this suit. And people think that I've dressed up just to attend this, this conference. Uh, so you run into that problem every now and again, but I think it's, it's a cost worth paying. Funny. <laughs> then, yeah, I, th I think one thing in common we both have is that we really love an animals. <laughs> and really want to uh, better their life and um, so uh, like tips on vegan advocacy like there are like yeah like so many different ways to like help animals and so on and for somebody who have figured out as you mentioned earlier that like okay that is something which is like neglected i would love to help do you have have any thoughts around like vegan advocacy don't jump the gun don't if you want to start talking about advocacy for any ethical cause a lot of the time people can become very enthusiastic because they listen to some powerful speakers they become convinced and they think i need to do everything i can here but if you're not ready if you're new to a subject area if you're not a confident public speaker then you can end up causing a detriment because you might not be as good at it as you expect if you're not prepared then even a bad objection from somebody can throw you off you, even if it's an objection that somebody puts to you that could be answered, it doesn't actually make that much sense. If you don't know how to respond to it, you're going to be a bit dead in the water. And so, you know, don't get started too quickly. But th there are a few things that you can do once you are, uh, once you are in that sphere and you are talking to people. I think in the area of vegan advocacy, it's incredibly important to be aware of the the reputation that veganism has. V vegans are are known for being extreme and radical and pushy and annoying and woke and this kind of stuff. And we need to be aware of that kind of perception and try to battle against it by signaling the opposite. So I think one of the best ways of doing this is avoiding being dogmatic. Dogma exists everywhere and dogma isn't necessarily, the contents of dogma isn't, aren't always going to be bad. Dogma is just a principle or set of principles that are unquestion, unquestioningly held it doesn't say anything about the contents. It doesn't follow from this that a belief that's held dogmatically must be a bad belief. For instance, I think that most people, most young people in the modern West are dogmatically not racist. They've just been told from birth racism is wrong and they genuinely internalize it. And you know, it's one of the first generations in, in human history that because they've sort of been taught it from their very birth. They, they really feel this way. But rarely do we ask why. Rarely do we sort of actually go through with people the reasons why. We, get, we give some, some basic surface level reasons why. We say, well, because, you know, nobody, you know, a person's skin color doesn't determine how they behave or something. But the racists don't exactly think that either. They might just think that, you know, skin color is correlated with a kind of uh, characteristic of a, of a culture or something like this. That's not quite what they what they believe. And so, sure, like it's a good thing that you're not a racist, but if you hold that belief essentially dogmatically, that is, it's just a belief that it would be weird to question it, right? In most contexts, if you ask somebody, well, why is racism wrong? It would raise some eyebrows, but it's something you have to do at least once in your life to make sure you can answer that question. Because otherwise, when you run up against a racist, you're going to have no idea what to say to them. Because you'll, you'll, you'll say to them, look, I don't think that a person's skin color determines their moral worth. And they say, well, neither do I. But I think that you know, the certain characteristics that people portray 
uh, is what grounds their moral worth. And I think that those characteristics are correlated with skin color. Mm. And then you're like, oh, okay. Now, of course, there is a way to respond to that, but it might catch you off guard if you haven't thought about it before. And so the same thing applies in any area of advocacy. So if you're a vegan, maybe you became vegan because somebody said, oh, well, if, if you wouldn't do it to a dog, why would you do it to a pig? You know? And someone goes, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And so they don't think they're being dogmatic because they think, well, I know why I don't eat pigs because I wouldn't do it to a dog. But why wouldn't you do it to a dog? Oh, come on, man. It's, it's a dog, you know? Well, that's not good enough. You need, to have a, you need to have a better reason so that when someone comes along and says, well, maybe I would do it to a dog, you can have a conversation with them too. If you just hold some, if you hold a belief like, well, let's not harm dogs or animal cruelty is wrong, I think it's a good belief. But if you're holding it dogmatically, you're going to run into problems. And so I think that one of the best things you can do is eliminate dogma. And the way to test for that is to reevaluate these beliefs, question them. The most obvious ones are often the ones that need more questioning. Because if you hold a controversial or unpopular belief, chances are you've thought through it a little bit more. But if it's something really, really obvious at the very basic the basis of your ethical thinking, oftentimes it goes completely unanalyzed. So we need to revisit our basic principles. Why is animal cruelty wrong? Why does suffering matter? Why? I mean, we might say animals have worth because humans do. I mean, if humans have worth, why don't animals? It's like, okay, why do humans have worth? What does that mean? We need to actually reevaluate this from the ground up to avoid dogmatic thinking, which I think is, mm. you know, sometimes present in the vegan community, to say the least. And to kind of uh, help us understand, like, how we can question ourselves like that, I'm wondering, like, do you have any, like, unpopular opinions or anything that you have, like, thought about, like, a lot and have, like, a good reasoning for Mm, unpopular opinions. Well, it depends. It depends on who you ask, right? Because I have unpopular p opinions, for instance, within veganism or within the vegan community. Yeah, I faced a lot of pushback for some of my views. For example, I made a video not long ago explaining why I don't think non-human animals can have a right to life in a, in the same way that human beings do. That was quite unpopular, mm. but that came as a result of really reevaluating from the ground up why it is that we might think human beings have a right to life. Uh, and, I mean, we talked a little bit about this over breakfast, but if we think about certain rights that human beings have, uh, if, so for instance, uh, vegans often think that animal ownership is wrong. Some, some will say that owning pets is wrong. Uh, certainly in the context of farming animals, they say that it's wrong to inflict suffering on them, but even just the concept of owning an animal is seen as a bad thing. And the reason for this is because we say, well, look, we, we, we all agree that it's wrong to own human beings. This is a great evil to say that we own another human being. But really, what's the relevant difference here between a human and an animal? If it's wrong to own a human, why wouldn't it be wrong to own a pig or a chicken? And I think, well, what we need to do is reevaluate, is it wrong and why is it wrong, if so, to own another human being? Like, it's not a question that's asked very often. Like, why is that wrong? Where did that come? Because people haven't always thought this. Let's not forget that this isn't morally obvious throughout most of human history. In fact, this is still quite a radical experiment to treat every human being as if they have some form of intrinsic moral worth. Like, why not own, own another human being? Well, because it causes a lot of suffering. Okay, sure. Yeah, but that's not it, is it? Because even if you own another human being but treat them really nicely, let's say they don't even know that you own them, you know? They, ne they never even come into contact with, the, with that thought. But it is still the case that, you know, somewhere on a bit of legal paper, you own this human being. People would still want to say that this is wrong. Why? Well, maybe it's got something to do with a sense of dignity or self-respect that you are preventing a human being from having by claiming to own them. Okay, fine. But these seem to me uniquely human characteristics, something like a concept of dignity. I don't think that can be meaningfully applied to a pig or a chicken. And so if at least part of the reason why we think that not just the kind of ownership that causes suffering, but just ownership in general is wrong of human beings, might have something to do with concepts like dignity, then if non-human animals don't have those concepts, or don't have those qualities, don't have those capacities, let's say, then we can't use the same reasoning to say that ownership of animals is always going to be wrong in principle. And so maybe it's actually okay, in some circumstances at least, to own another animal, maybe to own it as a pet or to consider it property in that sense. Um, I don't think you can go quite that far because I think to truly own something means that you can essentially do whatever you like with it. And I think that that's not morally okay when it comes to non-human animals. You can't do anything you, you like to them. But the concept of uh, keeping them fenced in, for example, you know, in like a, even in a sanctuary, you know, you're going to have to put a fence up. 
you wouldn't do this to human beings. At least, you know, except for some circumstances, you know. There, there does seem to be a, a, a difference here. Also within veganism, I mean, I, I started my approach to veganism because I read Animal Liberation and I thought that animal suffering matters and I thought I want to do everything I can to minimize this. And really my, my arguments have been against factory farming. If you watch my talks or listen to my podcast, when people ask me why it is that we should stop contributing to this industry, it's because the industry is so horrific. I've often said that there are many circumstances in which I think it would be okay to kill and eat animals. If it involves less suffering, for example, or if you're not actually having a, a, a measurable effect on the suffering of an animal, certainly in the, in the instance of food going to waste, but also if you're faced with a decision between eating a hunted elk or something uh, that has just been shot in the wild and can feed you for a a, a long period of time versus eating some imported vegan food that was grown with lots of crop deaths and then environmental pollution from traveling halfway across the globe. It might well be that eating that hunted animal is going to cause less animal suffering. And for me, if that's the case, then that's what we should be eating. And now, of course, I don't mean that broadly because we couldn't generalize this to a global scale because our demand is way too high. We could never mm. survive on hunting alone. But I mean, in that particular instance, mm. What's the vegan thing to do here? Well, some people think, well, animals have a right to life, and by shooting that animal, you know, you're, you're violating that right, and so you, know, you should just never do that. But to me, no. The, the question is, what's actually going to have an impact on animal suffering? Similarly, if, if it is actually the case that going to the supermarket and buying a tin of tuna isn't going to make a difference to the amount of animals that are being killed, then I don't know if I could be convinced that that's wrong. Because if it's not having any measurable effect, then how could it possibly be wrong? It may be that we've got this totally the wrong way around, that we shouldn't be blaming each other for our consumption, but rather blaming the companies that are producing these animal products. We catch hundreds of thousands of wild fish from our oceans every like four seconds. I think mm. it's about 150 or 250,000 wild fish. Me going to a supermarket and buying a tin of tuna really going to make a difference? Maybe not. And I think if, if we're going to be vegan... We need to actually seriously consider this. We need to consider the possibility that it might be the case, that that's actually just not wrong, because the, 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 the focal point of the ethic here is not in individual purchase decisions, but rather at an institutional level. This is something that needs to be considered, and that's quite unpopular too, because it mm. requires the suggestion that it might actually just be fine to go and eat tuna. It's like, I don't know, I'm trying to work this out. Exactly, yeah. And, and I think that it's, I guess, kind of unpopular to, to do that, but I'm, I'm more than happy to just become convinced that veganism is, is totally the wrong way to be going about it. It's not about just refraining from buying these products at all. Um, it would be a, a pretty radical shift, but it's something that we have to be willing to accept because if you're not going into a conversation genuinely thinking you could change your mind, then what are you doing? On that, I'm wondering, like, sometimes I can, like, kind of be, like, scared to think out loud, especially when podcast. <laughs> mm. Because, yeah, like, so often, like, I try to, like, think or rethink and, and, like, understand topics. And then it can be kind of scary sometimes because of, like, yeah, cancel culture and stuff like that. But before we jump into cancel culture, they are, like, super related, I guess. But, like, do, do you have any thoughts on, like, uh, I guess, like, how to be, like, more confident in, like, talking out loud, talking through problems, like asking questions which might be like unpopular, but like, or like saying out loud thoughts that you think exist in the world and that you should think about, but they're not like your thoughts, if that makes sense. Yeah. But like, oh, what about this thought? And then you say it out loud, kind of, kind of, kind of. and trying to, uh, like, because I run two NGOs and like, we have to do like a lot of rethinking about our like cost areas, what we're going to do and so on. So yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I think it's just it's just got to make sure that it's clear that that's what you're doing. There's a difference between me saying, if I sit down here and say, factory farming is an abomination and needs to be abolished at the earliest available opportunity, that's very different from me saying, but, you know, we need to consider that it might be the case that buying a tin of tuna isn't wrong. That, that, that's a very different tone. And it's just about the way that it's presented. I, I'm not going to have people pinning me down and saying, you said that eating a tin of tuna is, is moral, buying a tin of tuna from the supermarket is moral, because I didn't say that. It's very clear from the context of our conversation that that might be the case, and I'm willing to be, consider, uh, to, to be convinced of that. But as of now, I, I remain agnostic on that question, let's say. 
and that's a product of just having a conversation in the style of thinking out loud, just prefacing your your considerations by saying it might be the case that or I think this could yeah. be the case or even just saying that you're thinking out loud mm. you know avoid using the phrase devil's advocate because that's that's very it's cringe you know people are constantly saying well just to play devil's advocate but like I, I just I just find that to be cringe inducing for some reason because half the time people aren't being devil's advocate they're just saying what they think and are too scared to say so so they say they're being the devil's advocate but also it's just a bit of a a bit of an overused phrase I think uh, but making it clear that that's essentially what you're doing. Because it's not playing devil's advocate, right? People say that they're playing devil's advocate, but to play the devil's advocate is to advocate for the evil position. It's to sort of purposefully represent the false view, the bad view, in order to buttress a conversation. That's not what we're doing when we're thinking out loud. We're not saying, well, let's, let's you know, try these bad ideas on for size. It's like, we don't know if these ideas are good or bad, so let's try them all on for size and, and see what works. And just make it clear that that's what you're doing. Ask, yeah. Asking questions instead of making points, you know. Mm. If somebody says that buying animal products is wrong, you know, don't say, but it makes a negligible effect on the demand. Say, but is that still true if it has a negligible effect on demand? Simply rephrasing it as a question shows that you're not committing yourself to a point, but rather trying to investigate a question openly, you know. Mm. Then, uh, cancel culture. I'm wondering, what are your thoughts around that? Uh, we haven't had any, or like, I, I haven't personally, or okay, I actually have, like, I, <laughs> I have personally experienced, like, one kind of cancel culture event uh, where, yeah, like, it, it was, like, a open room, and then, like, one person said some, like, horrible things towards me, and uh, one of my organizations which came out of nowhere for me and then uh, the other people in the room it was like a panel dis discussion they all like turn against me and the organization basically uh, not knowing like the whole story of course or stories and that was like that really brought me into like understand like like how this is a thing like and this is like really powerful and can be really hard so how to like manage that or just like thoughts around cancel culture, I guess. Mm. Yeah. And I'm not sure if I even can ca call it cancel culture. Maybe they will listen now and they like, oh, <laughs> like now we're canceling you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, can cancel uh, attempts to cancel people, so to speak. Bit of a strange phrase, really, canceling a human being. Mm. Attempts rarely work. There are, there are very few examples of somebody being saying something controversial, consistently saying controversial things, and this bring, being brought to attention, a whole controversy is generated, and then that person is actually cancelled. Sometimes it does seem to be somewhat effective in the most uh, famous cases. Andrew Tate is a recent example. Just out of nowhere started exploding all over social media. Couldn't escape the guy. Mm. And social media companies came together and essentially conspired to get him off all the platforms and it seems to have worked. I mean, sure, he has like a podcast on Rumble now or something. And okay, he's going to get views on there, but he's not going to get as many views as he would have got otherwise. And he's probably doing more for Rumble than Rumble is doing for him, if it is Rumble. Mm. Um, and if, if, it, if it wasn't important to be on these platforms in order to get your voice out, then you wouldn't be on them in the first place, right? And so uh, cancellation on that scale seems to be effective. But the kind of cancel culture that you're talking about, which, as you say, is it's not literally canceling someone's account, but a culture of this person ought to be punished for what they've said, either because they deserve it because they're evil or because we need to prevent these ideas from being heard, uh, is oftentimes simply not effective. You know, J.K. Rowling's of the world, people have tried endlessly to smear her image and it has been smeared to the extent that you can't mention her without it being controversial now but it's not like she's going to fail to sell books it's not like she's going to be impoverished by the situation um sometimes people use this as a defense i've done a few debates on free speech and cancel culture and once or twice people have said but look i mean you know what are you scared of here you know oh jk rowling getting cancelled look she's still selling books so it obviously can't be that bad but it's not about what actually happens, it's about what people want to happen. Right? Because a lot of the people who are trying to cancel J.K. Rowling, they see themselves as essentially having failed. What they would like to see happen is that you know she gets banned from Twitter or whatever, and that people stop buying her books, and that she essentially falls into ruin because of 
uh, the things that she's said. Okay, even if it's unsuccessful, it's still troubling to me that that's what people want, even if it doesn't actually end up working. Social media is an incredibly powerful tool, as we all know, but it's something we're really only just beginning to come to grips with. It's still kind of a wild west out there. I mean, sure, companies have regulation, but when something becomes a big enough story and enough people are tweeting about it, there's just no way to keep on top of it all. It's essentially a kind of punishment. It's a, it's a social punishment. And the golden rule of punishment is that the punishment must be proportionate to the crime. And there are a few crimes that a person can commit that warrant the, the equivalent of dropping a nuclear bomb on a single individual. If you become the focal point of the world's attention, and this doesn't just happen to celebrities now, but it can happen to anybody. Mm. If you become the focal point of the world's attention, you might just see it as, oh, you're just getting a few nasty tweets and you know, maybe a death threat or two. But it's, it's difficult to describe the levels of anxiety and stress that that can put upon a person. Now, maybe they've done something wrong. Maybe they told a racist joke. Okay. Even if they need to be punished for that, which itself is questionable, depending on the nature of the joke, the level of punishment that comes along with allowing people on social media to just hound this person is certainly troubling to me. But of course, it's not like you can stop people from voicing their opinions. You can stop them from being abusive and, and this kind of thing. But you can't stop people from just saying, I think this person should never be listened to again, which is why it's cancel culture. It's a cultural thing. The only way to solve this moral qualm is to engender a culture of, uh, of proportionate punishment and a culture of forgiveness for genuine apology. It, it's strange. Some people have pointed out that that there seems to be a total unwillingness to forgive people. And oftentimes, somebody, somebody pointed out once that it's, it's, uh, people like to say that cancel culture is mostly a quality of the left, and this m may well be true, but it means that the same people who are constantly saying that because you made this racist joke or because you said a transphobic comment in an essay, your entire life work should be to be diminished and people should stop buying your books and this kind of thing. The same people who advocate for uh, rehabilitative justice, which is that if you've committed a, a, a murder or uh, an assault or something in your past, that the kind of prison system that we should have is one which designs you to be put back into society eventually. And so there seems to be a bit of a discord there. One of the reasons why rehabilitative justice has become more popular is because firstly, we recognize that punishment is a bit of a it's a bit of a dubious concept when you consider that a lot of the t reasons that people are committing crime is because of their upbringing or because of factors that are essentially outside of their control. We think that maybe it's a little bit unfair to say that they just flatly deserve this punishment, mm. but also because it's, it's actually more effective and creates a more stable society to have a system that genuinely tries to rehabilitate people. The same thing should be applied culturally to people that we consider to have bad ideas. If somebody says something you don't like and you essentially go to war with them, by trying to cancel them. Firstly, it's probably not going to work. And secondly, it's just going to start this battle. That's why we have the culture wars. If we come at it with a, with a sense of like, well, I think this person has said something really quite terribly horrible, but there must be some reason that they're saying it. There must be something about it. And even if it's the kind of thing that deserves some kind of punishment, it shouldn't be the kind of level of punishment that completely expels any possibility for forgiveness. Um, so look, I, I mean, I don't like it. I don't like cancel culture, but I also... I don't think it's a very easy thing to define or, or pin down. Uh, a lot of the time people will just say something a bit controversial, they'll get some hate for it on social media and they claim they're being cancelled. But come on, yeah. man, like, you're not. You know, Piers Morgan has a new show called Piers Morgan Uncensored. Like, who was censoring this guy? Maybe he got mm. fired from a job once or twice because he said something a bit outrageous or because he was, you know, hacking into people's phones mm. or whatever. But, like, you're not cancelled, man. Like, yeah. people know who you are. People still follow you on Twitter. People are listening to your interviews. Like, it just seems overdramatic and, and silly to yeah. describe this overwhelming force of cancel culture that, that a lot of the time just doesn't even exist. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's what happened to me. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yeah, that's good to get that out of the way. Yeah, nice. Not cancelled. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> to... Okay, so from like cancel culture and like maybe what I would just say like bad communication, maybe, um, over to like good conversations. Like, yeah, you're like 
debating a lot or like and talking to a lot of yeah in podcasts you have your own youtube where you also like use a lot of communication um so i'm wondering yeah this is also regarding basically just right now as well like do you have like tips on like how to hold like good conversations and debates and so on i'm also like planning a, a conference where we're gonna have like panel debates and so on um so yeah from somebody who has like been doing a lot of debates and so on what do you think and i also just uh, recently saw a video which was about cancel culture it was like a at oxford uh and this like zoom call and i listened to your speech mm. there i think but i just didn't listen to the other ones but yeah so back to like good conversations and good communications yeah um i mean there there are lots of ways to improve your communication skills most of the time it involves listening when people think i want to be a better communicator they think well what are the things i can say maybe it's not about speaking maybe it's maybe it's just that you need to say less and and listen a bit more carefully and listen properly listen to what the person is telling you listen to their question in its entirety before answering it don't think oh i know this one you know as soon as somebody's halfway through a question like you might say to your, you, you might say to me so on the topic of cancel culture, and immediately my head could go, oh yeah, I, I, I know my thoughts about cancel culture. Here, yeah. are my, here are my points that I make about cancel culture. Here are the things that I'm going to say. And now I'm not even listening to you anymore because I'm, I'm just waiting for my opportunity to speak. Mm -hmm. like you, might, you might say something completely different to where, where I think you're going with it. And so you must listen to the question in its entirety and stop using stock responses. S stop, stop just relying on this arsenal of pre-prepared uh, points that you're just going to revisit every time that the topic comes up. Answer every question like it's a new one. Um, otherwise, you can run into some embarrassment and miscommunication. But also, there's always going to be some legitimacy to what a person is saying. Even if they make a, a horrendously bad point that just seems like the stupidest thing you've ever said, there's going to be some reason that they're saying it. There's going to be some conditional that might be true. It might be like, well, you're totally wrong, but if this were the case, I could see why you think that. And there's the, there's the logical connection that you've made. Now we can talk about why the antecedent is false, why that's not the case, and so this other thing is not the case. But trying as hard as you can to recognize why somebody's come to the view that they have is one of the most important things that you can do. Mm. So if you're talking to somebody who seems genuinely evil or malicious to you, if we, we, we must recognize that Every human being is capable of this. There are certain conversations that we could have or things that I could say that some people in the world would think are horrendously evil or terrible or just unthinking. And we have to recognize that we all have a capacity for this. And what that means is that when you're faced with it, you don't scoff at a person for saying something you consider to be outrageous, but you genuinely try as hard as you can to figure out how they got there. That's the most important thing. And that's something you can only, you can only do through listening. And so communicating better is oftentimes about not speaking at all, but rather hearing what a person has to say properly. And regarding language, do you have any favorite words? There are lots of words that I, that I like to employ. Um, I was quite happy when I, when I discovered uh, a little while ago the word conspecifics, um, Con which is conspecific, which means member of the same species. So if you're looking for a word to refer to other people, um, that can be quite a good one. Um, How do you use it? Is it like my conspecific? Yeah. My, my conspecifics. You, you are a conspecific mm. you know, of mine. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's quite a fun one. Um, I'd, I'd say it might be my sort of word of the... It, it might have been my word of the month at one point, when, especially when I first went vegan. It was like, ah, oh, there's a good one to use. <laughs> cool. Do you use it for like animals as well? Or like, you can do. You can, are you can, they your... You can, or, they're not our or, conspecifics, oh, but they're oh. conspecifics of each other, if yeah. you like. Um, hmm. So you're my conspecific and yeah, yeah. You know, a dog might be another dog's conspecific, <laughs> yeah. but a dog is not your conspecific. Exactly, yeah. Or, yeah, who are you to say that? No, okay, yeah. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, and also, um, like, because, yeah, like, just trying to, um, Im I guess I improve my vocabulary, words, um, communication, and so on. So I'm also wondering, like, like, do you have any, like, favorite metaphors or, like, when you're trying to communicate some, some something, you're, this is my go-to for the moment, or like any like beautiful one, impactful ones, or? I think that the most important way to use metaphors is to try to come up with original ones wherever possible. 
I made a video not long ago about George Orwell and his position on the English language. He, he wrote a, an influential essay called Politics in the English Language about how to have better communication. And one of the points that he makes about why people often sound so uninspiring, especially in the political arena, is because of their usage of what he calls dying metaphors. Of course, there are such things as dead metaphors, which are important to distinguish from dying metaphors. Dead metaphors are things that began as metaphors, but were so overused that now they're just terms in themselves. For example, the word deadline. That starts as a metaphor. Deadline, right? That's, a, mm. that's supposed to evoke an imagery. Uh, but now it's just actually a, a word with its own definition that mm. we simply use to mean you know, the time by which something has to be done. Yeah. Or the concept of something being brand new. This used to be evoking imagery of something being forged in a, in a fire, branding. No way. But now it just means, now it just is a, is a term that we use with its own definition, if you see what I'm saying. So mm. a dead metaphor is something that began as a metaphor, but now you would actually find in a dictionary as just a, a phrase with its own definition. Mm. Um, even, a, even a word like rewind, that's something that we used to physically do. And so like rewinding on a, on a, on a computer, it doesn't really make much sense, but it's just a word now. It's not supposed to evoke an imagery of literally winding something up. Mm. There are also dying metaphors, which aren't quite which just words in themselves, yeah? You wouldn't find them in a dictionary, but are so overused as to be terribly boring and uninspiring. So Orwell gives examples including uh, stand shoulder to shoulder with, you know, we must stand shoulder to shoulder with our, with our allies and take up arms against our enemies. Take up arms is another one. Like, Phrases like these are supposed to evoke a, a form of imagery. That's why these phrases were invented. But they're so overused now that when you hear somebody say stand shoulder to shoulder with, you're not really imagining people standing in a line. You can imagine the first time somebody said that. That phrase had never mm. been used. We must stand shoulder to shoulder with them. Wow, that's, that's powerful. That's poetic. Now it just evokes absolutely nothing. And so yeah. we, we should try to avoid using metaphors that have been, been used a lot before in, the, in mm. this way. Another example that... Orwell gives his toe the line, you know, you have to toe the line. You don't imagine people literally sort of towing up to a line. It's, it's quite a poetic way of putting it, but now it's just a, it's just a phrase that's totally overused. Um, I made a list of my own, actually, which <laughs> I can, I can, because I, I started noticing yeah. as people, when, when people were talking, when I was reading things, yeah. if somebody used metaphors that I, that I realized are just, they just don't evoke imagery anymore. So mm, for example, mm. uh, uh, thrown out the window, you know, when somebody oh, yeah. says, oh, this, this, this idea was thrown out of the window. That's kind of a dying metaphor, right? Mm. Because the, the, it's a bit overused and, and the imagery is lost. Um, or a weight off your shoulders. Oh, that's such mm. a weight off my shoulders. Again, originally, this had never been used before. You'd think, wow, what a, what a poetic way of describing the feeling of mm. relief. But now it's just a dying metaphor. Um, even saying like, stand by, like, oh, I'm going to stand by my friend. Mm. This is supposed to be a metaphor, right? It's supposed to evoke imagery of standing by somebody, standing next to them in the face of adversaries. But now it's it's just kind of a just kind of a phrase that doesn't evoke uh, any any imagery. Um, or wrap your head around is another one. Or jumping on a bandwagon. You know, people always talk about oh yeah, jumping on that bandwagon. But again, you're not picturing the imagery anymore. So Orwell points out that it's just very important if you want to have effective communication to come up with metaphors of your own or to use ones that are that are less popular um one that i quite like that i found in a dostoevsky novel was uh falling between two stools i like that as a as a metaphor the idea being that if you've sort of got two things to choose between and you're shuffling between them and can't quite make your mind up you end up hitting neither of them and and sort of falling between the middle and falling between two stools is a metaphor for that the idea of sort of not knowing which stool to sit on and you end up just falling in the middle of them so i quite like using that as a as a metaphor when describing people who are so stuck between two choices that they end up doing nothing um that's not original because it's been used before but i think it's it's not dying in the same way that saying you know stand by your friends is, yeah. is dying so that's quite a fun one that i like mm. to use <laughs> cool i also really like the one which is uh um, oh, or is this an, I'm not sure if you use it in English or just Norwegian, but when you say something, it's just like one stone throw away. Oh, stone throw, yeah. Stone throw, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. that's another, for me, that still <laughs> does evoke some imagery. Like when someone says yes. it's a stone's throw away, it's a, it's an uncommon enough phrase that I still kind of imagine somebody throwing a stone. So it's, yeah, same. it's certainly, I, I wouldn't, I don't know if it's quite a dying metaphor. It might be a kind of, um, might be an ill metaphor. It might be yeah. sort of, it might have a bit of a, 
bit of a fever or something that that <laughs> might kill it eventually. Uh, it's mm. so, somewhere there, but that's that's quite a good one too. But the most mm. uh, effective way to communicate is is to come up with your own. Yeah. Um, and it's difficult yeah. to to do that on the spot because it depends on the circumstance, right? True. But it's a it, it's an important skill to have because somebody came up with these phrases. Mm. Somebody was the first person to describe. Uh, having your friends back as standing by them having your friends back is itself a is is a is a dying metaphor like somebody there was somebody who was the first person to think that's a good way of putting it yeah i i have your back mm. you know somebody has to sort of come up with this stuff yeah and if we don't come up with new ones then our language becomes impoverished for it mm. so uh, yeah trying to come up with a new metaphor like don't use any metaphors that you're used to seeing in print. That was one of Orwell's rules for good writing. Okay. And I yeah. think it's, a, it's one to live by. Mm. And you mentioned Dovietsky. Do you have, um, I've, I've heard that name many times, but I haven't read anything. Mm. Do you have any, yeah, like tips, thoughts? Uh, plenty. Um, Dostoevsky is a, a difficult person to read in many respects, not just because many of his novels are so long, but because the subject matter is quite confronting. Um, I recommend to people that they start with Notes from the Underground, partly because it's it's short, it's maybe a hundred pages or so. And so you get to say to people that you've read Dostoevsky without having to read Crime and Punishment or Brothers Karamazov <laughs> yeah. or something. Uh, but it's also just a good way to get to grips with Dostoevsky's views. It was written before these great big novels that he's more famous for, and so it might make some chronological sense as well. Uh, but I think everybody needs to read at least Crime and Punishment and The Brothers Karamazov before they die, partly just because of the influence that these have in a, in a literary space. If you want to read books, it's just important to be familiar with these, I think, but also because the concepts discussed within them are, are, are put rather rather beautifully. The, the Brothers Karamazov in particular is quite famous for the scene with the Grand Inquisitor, um, which essentially, as I interpret it as Dostoevsky's response to the problem of evil, it seems to encapsulate for me the idea that logical objection to God's existence is best met with essentially emotional response, and that Dostoevsky is trying to say that that's, that, that competes with rational criticism and sometimes is more important. Um, Ivan Karamazov does this whole spiel of listing off the problem of evil and, and not understanding why God would allow the suffering that, that so uh, permeates the world. And then he tells this poem of the, the Grand Inquisitor um, during the Inquisition meeting Jesus himself and explaining to Jesus why he thinks Jesus is totally wrong and criticizing Jesus for his religious decisions. He talks about Jesus being tempted by Satan in the desert and says that you should have taken the devil's offer. Like he disagrees with, with Jesus and he's criticizing him, saying that he's, he's essentially done something quite evil. Uh, and Jesus' response is to say nothing but just to go and kiss the Grand Inquisitor. And this is this kind of stuns him. And this is Jesus' response. That's quite a strange story. But it seems to me as if this is supposed to be considered a response. And when Ivan tells the story to his brother, Alyosha, Alyosha ends up responding by kissing Ivan. And it's all a little bit complicated. It seems to say to me that if Ivan is supposed to represent the atheistic part of Dostoevsky's psyche, these are legitimate criticisms. They are rational criticisms. And they're not the kind of things that warrant a rational response because they're too difficult to offer an explanation for. But that there's more than one way of meeting this objection and one way of doing it is essentially through emotional outpouring. This is quite a controversial interpretation of that story, but then there is a letter that Dostoevsky wrote to a friend once, which said that, in which Dostoevsky wrote that if all of the facts lay outside of Jesus, if truth lay outside of Christ, I'd sooner throw myself in with Christ and reject the facts than reject Christ and throw myself in with the facts. So he was very clearly sort of a, a Christian first, uh, and I think that that's... That most comes out in the Brothers Karamazov, which is why I'd recommend mm. people to, to read it. Wow, yeah. yeah. There are a lot of things there I <laughs> yeah, need to understand, I guess. <laughs> it's, it's, worth, it's worth checking out, man. It really mm. is. Um, Notes cool. from the Underground has some good commentary on free will and man's relationship mm. with free will. Mm. Uh, 
the Crime and Punishment famously uh, deals with the topic of guilt. So it kind of depends what you're interested in. If you're, yeah, yeah. If you're interested in religious philosophy, let's say, then maybe start with Brothers Karamazov. Mm. Um, but if you're not into reading hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of Russian literature, then yeah. uh, Notes from the Underground is a good place to start. Cool. I'll do that. Uh, people yeah. also uh, often mi- or, or maybe don't know that there was supposed to be a section in Notes from the Underground mm. in which the necessity of Christianity is described. That this was censored um, by, the, by the Russian state. And so f- sort of further evidence of, of the Christian theme running through uh, Dostoevsky's novels and the idea that Christianity almost as a, as a non-rational uh, response to the rational criticisms of the world because Notion the Underground is a quite de- depressing book uh, mm. chronicling a, a rather depressive and um, narcissistic person. And once again, we have evidence that Dostoevsky's response to this rational criticism is just blunt Christianity. But we don't actually know this from reading the book now because that part was taken out of the book. We only know from letters that he wrote his friends that he didn't like that this was, this was taken out of the book. But it seems to me that the message here Interesting. that Christianity is a, is a way to respond to the suffering of the world, not because it offers a rational criticism or a rational response to the objection, uh, but because it provides a kind of emotional fulfillment that on its own merit is enough to respond to rational criticism. Do you have any other favorite books and podcasts or like, like I guess, like favorite resources? Mm, um, I mean, gosh, it, it, it depends. Um, podca- I'm, not, I'm not a huge, huge listener of podcasts. I, 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 sometimes it, it kind of depends on the guests. Mm. I, I don't really have go-to podcasts that I listen to because I really like the podcast and I'll listen to everybody that they have on. Um, and that's why I tend to find myself listening to the most popular uh, podcast. So I'll listen to Lex Friedman and I'll listen to Joe Rogan, but only really when they have a guest on that I'm particularly interested in. Yeah. Um, yeah. Also, I mentioned uh, Chris's podcast earlier, Modern Wisdom, which is another good podcast because uh, I, I keep up to date with that too uh, because, well, Chris is a friend, but he's also a wonderful podcaster. Mm. And so that's a, another one that I enjoy listening to. Um, but because I, I don't listen to a lot of podcasts, it, it means that I, I kind of really only engage with those that I that I know because my friend is doing it or because it's as big as the Joe Rogan podcast or something. Yeah. Um, books, books wise, things are very different. Um, there, are, there are lots of books that I can recommend, but it, it depends on the subject area that you're interested in. I always recommend that people read Animal Liberation by Peter Singer if they haven't already. Yeah. But that's obviously specifically about animal ethics. Um, that's usually my sort of first go-to book recommendation for people, even if you're vegan already, I, I highly recommend reading it because I still think it is to this day the best philosophical defense mm. of the the ethical consideration of animals. The first chapter of that book, I mean. Back to animal rights, or like, uh, I'm wondering. I hear like people talking about like uh, like speciesism. Do you know like the definition of speciesism, or do you want like uh, explain that word? Yeah, first? well, uh, it's. Uh, Singer, I think, defines it. I don't know the word he uses, but it will be uh, something like something like discriminatory treatment or consideration on the basis of species. But I think that the the phrase is often confused. And Singer points out that it sounds like a parody of racism or sexism. It's almost offensive mm. to suggest that speciesism can be put into that category. Mm. Uh, but one of the most important ways that it's misunderstood is that it it's not speciesist. Let's say to treat different species differently right it, it's only speciesist to do it on the grounds of species alone and nothing more an example that peter singer gives that maybe you actually can't use this example today but you understand the point mm. is that if we want to eliminate sexism if we want sort of equal rights for men and women let's say it doesn't mean giving men abortion rights as I say, a bit more complicated in, in today's age, but you see what I'm saying. Yeah, It's not sexist to say that women should have abortion rights, but not men. And the reason it's not sexist is because we're not saying you don't get to have this right because you're a man. Technically, what we're saying is you don't have this right because it doesn't apply to you because you don't have a womb and not having a womb is correlated with being a man, right? It's not because you're a man, because you are a a member of that sex group that you don't get this right. It's because 
by being a member of the sex group, you have a quality by virtue of which you don't have this right. But that's not sexist. In the same way, it's, it's not speciesist to treat different animals differently. Because, as I say, the concept of speciesism is often mocked. It seems ridiculous. And it seems ridiculous because, of course, we should sp treat different species differently. We should treat fish differently from the way that we treat pigs. We might say that fish need to be in water, for example. But we say that you know, uh, pigs don't have the same right to, to live in a big ocean space. Is that because they're pigs? Kind of, but not really. It's not strictly because they're pigs. It's because of the fact that you know, they, they can't survive underwater and that pigs generally can't survive underwater. So it's not because they're pigs, but because they can't survive underwater. Mm. And it just so happens that being a pig means that you can't survive underwater. But the justification for treating them differently isn't just crudely one is one species, one is another species. Mm. But the qualities that this species has makes us want to treat them differently. And so speciesism is just where somebody is treating species differently just on the ground of species with no sort of uh, no good justification in terms of the various different characteristics or qualities that these species actually have, mm. but just because they're members of a different species. Is it, but so do you use the word speciesism then? Or do you maybe, like, is I, it misleading kind of, or like... It's, I, I find it a bit clunky. Yeah. I find it a bit, uh, it can be a bit cringeworthy as well, especially if you're talking to somebody who is not particularly friendly to the idea of animal ethics. Mm. To use the word speciesism might just totally put them off. It sounds like a bit of a, a woke buzz term. Mm. Um, even if it has a perfectly legitimate usage, mm. I sometimes find that it can kind of put people off. Is the same with the word vegan? Yeah, not, not quite as bad because vegan is a bit of, more of a mainstream term. Okay. But similarly, yeah. there are times where you might want to avoid it um, depending on the person that you're talking to. Sometimes yeah. it can simply be more effective to say, I don't eat animals or to say that you're against factory farming or something and to say mm. that you're a vegan because again it can rub people up the wrong way but then sometimes you want to do that too sometimes mm. you want to say you're a vegan because it's going to make people go oh look there's a vegan because they need to be reminded that such people do exist so mm. it's all kind of context dependent and then in the like <laughs> vegan world or like a uh, world of animal rights and so on there are like i i know like like different times people have told me or like we have been talking about like how to uh, like help the world improve and then um some arguments can be that like if we fix this like sp yeah speciesism thing or like animal rights uh if everyone turns vegan and so on then like all the other world problems will kind of like be fixed as well have you heard that kind of argument or like thought if you know yeah what I, mean? I mean i think it's ridiculously utopian to suggest that all the world's problems will be fixed yeah there is yeah. a point to make that there are certain kinds of prejudices that can be affected by an adoption of uh, animal consideration. It's often pointed out, for example, that if you raise a child to think that just because a living being is a member of a different species doesn't mean you get to mistreat them, it's going to be very difficult for that child to grow up as a racist because if they're, if they're unwilling to mistreat a chicken, mm. because despite how different they are from a chicken, very unlikely that they're going to be able to rationalize treating another human being differently because of a difference in uh, ethnicity or culture. Yeah. And so there's, there's a sense in which that has a knock-on effect. But, you know, it is it's still possible. It's still possible that somebody could care more about chickens than they care about members of their own species of a different race. Possible that that can happen. Mm. Uh, it's not a given that these problems are going to go away. And the world's never going to be rid of problems. Pro problem, and problems are so often dependent on the on the time and the context that as soon as you set up a new system that that deals with every problem that we're facing today it's going to bring along problems of its own um you know let's not be utopian the root word for the, or the root words for utopia are literally no place it means a place that doesn't exist because utopia can't exist oh yeah so it's not the perfect place or like it's well it is like it's described as the perfect place but yeah. it literally means no place or like that yeah, okay, the perfect yeah, place yeah, yeah doesn't exist and can't exist. Mm. Mm. Um, Unless maybe like the kingdom of God or something, but yeah, certainly not of this earth. Yeah, no. Okay. And then to a little bit like more personal 
Mm. Um, well, like, uh, I'm wondering, uh, like, how do you like take care of yourself or like optimize like your life? Mm, I mean, quite a broad question. <laughs> um, how do you yeah. mean optimize my life? Uh, like, I'm thinking about like how you make sure, or like, if you do. Because I guess, like, it, yeah, it's basically up to people how you choose to live life. But when when you're like doing so many like talks and so on, thinking so deep about like a lot of different topics and like trying to sense make the best you can, uh, how do you put yourself in a position to think the best or mm. like be the best version of yourself? I guess get enough sleep. Try, especially if you've got some important thinking to be doing. If you're preparing for a for an upcoming event or something, I think it's beneficial to try to eat vaguely healthily um mm. to not spend a lot of time getting drunk or high um these things are, are fine to indulge in if, if you please but you you must know that they're going to have an effect on the way that you think the, the body is often overlooked as a source of improving cognitive capacity when people think about how to become smarter or think better or optimize themselves for conversation they think well i want to read more i want to listen more i want to learn more they very often ignore the idea of getting regular exercise and going to the gym a few times a week, eating breakfast every morning, waking up at a reasonable hour. These things probably have as much of an effect on your ability to have cogent conversations with people mm. as does uh, reading a bunch of books. They're yeah. incredibly important. So mm. try to stay on top of those things mm. and, and not neglect them as uh, people who are interested in podcasting and reading and writing and arguing tend to do they think that all you need is the brain yeah but yeah. for a materialist the brain is just a part of the body so you've got to look after the body if you want to look after the brain <laughs> yeah i once heard somebody say i think it was a scientist uh, or something who says like uh like from a sci scientist perspective like we are just like heads and then like the only function of the body is just to like transport the head from like different places <laughs> Mm. so yeah so really not taking care care of it but uh that they're just in their head all the time basically yeah mm. it's kind of really funny but yeah <laughs> yeah and 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 don't and it's like also you know get get another hobby like don't yeah spend all your time doing it you know mm. like have friends who don't constantly act as if they're in a podcast I, I mean i love those kinds of conversations but you need to just be able to talk about nothing yeah you know go go for go for walks go bowling you know mm. play a bit of pool like mm. Do whatever you can to make sure that you don't become consumed mm. by this dedication to the art of conversation, because otherwise you you just become a parody of of a, an intellectual person. Mm. Uh, you know, being a smart person, being well informed, having good conversations is supposed to be done so that we can use these insights to inform the way that we live our lives. Mm. It's not supposed to be the way that we live our lives. It's not. It's not the end in itself. We shouldn't yeah. just be thinking, okay, I'm going to have a good conversation and get a bunch of insights and that's, that's it. That's the end. No, this mm. is the means. The end is mm. the use of the insights that you mm. learn to give yourself a better life. Yeah. And you can only do that if you have a life outside of thinking, outside of podcasting, outside mm. of reading and intellectualism. Mm. You need to have a life of friendship and love and happiness and art yeah. and use the intellectual mm. pursuits to, to inform this part of your life, which is the most important. Mm. So what is a typical day for Alex? Or do, mm. you, ha do you have a typical day? Or like? Well, <laughs> um, I, su I suppose it would, it would be something like, I, I'm lucky in, in that I get to essentially work from a laptop in many ways, because if I'm editing or scripting or researching, it's all basically done from a laptop. So I tend to wake up and I like to you know, find some kind of coffee shop or something to just sit with a laptop and, and work. So it's either going to be doing broad research that maybe I don't have an idea of what I'm going to be making a video on or something. And so I'm just sort of poking around the internet, seeing, mm. seeing what's going on, seeing what people are talking about. Mm. Um, equally, if I've got a podcast coming up, I'll be listening to other podcasts that that person has done. I'll be reading their book, mm. this kind of thing. Um, but it could also be that I'm sitting down and editing. But on a video day, you know, I'll be setting up cameras and filming and this kind of stuff it's yeah it's a fairly i try to live a fairly straightforward simple life i get to do a lot of fun things when when i'm traveling and when i have events on it's a lot of flying a lot of traveling a lot of 
uh, speaking in front of audiences and meeting new people and this kind of stuff. And it's very exciting and it's very full on. Mm. And so when I'm not doing that, when I'm just at home making videos, it's very much just wake up, coffee shop, sit on the laptop, go to sleep. I meet up with my friends. I try, if, if I've got a free evening, we'll go to the pub, we'll play some mm. pool, do a poker night. Like cool. that's, that's the way to live for me, man. Like when I'm, mm. when I'm not, I'm, I'm kind of on and then off. Mm. I'll be on for a period of a few months or I'll be going around and doing lots of fun stuff. But then I just want to have a, have a calm, serene life of just sitting around in coffee shops and working on my videos. <laughs> nice. Music. Do you play drums? <laughs> I, I, I do. I do. But I'm primarily a guitarist. Would you believe it? Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I'm primarily a guitarist, but I, I do play the drums as well. Um, nice. Do you play any other instruments, by the way? I mean, like bass guitar. Which yeah. many people think is just the same as playing the guitar. You can often tell when somebody is a guitarist playing the bass because you, you think to yourself, well, if I can play the guitar, I can play the bass. It's like a step down. Mm. But it's a different instrument entirely. Mm. You know, um, I know a, a great deal of wonderful guitarists who are very talented, but you stick them on the bass and they're just playing the root note over and over again. It's, it's a, the, you've <laughs> got to treat it like its own beast. You know, yeah. you should be coming up with melodic bass lines. And I, I love doing that kind of thing. I used to be the bassist in a band and... Oh. It's probably the most fun that I had in a band scenario. More fun than being a lead guitarist or a okay. singer or something, because I've done that too. But something about playing the bass, it felt almost anonymous. Mm. The bass lines, I often thought, made some of the songs, because it yeah. was some of the most uh, recognizable melodic parts of the music. But it's it's almost like you go unnoticed. Mm. It Bass guitar is oftentimes, it's not something that you really notice. You just notice when it's not there. You notice when it's not right. Mm. You're supposed to be a little bit unnoticeable. Uh, depending on the context of the song. So did you play in a band or? Mm, yeah, I've played in various bands cool. throughout my life. Nice. Uh, yeah, yeah, different different kinds of bands as well. I was in. Yeah, a, which music? Like. Well, we uh, we I used to be in a kind of. It's difficult to describe. You, you maybe call it something like funk metal. Um, it was kind of very riffy, very high gain, loud type music, but mm. with a with a kind of rhythmic funk i guess it was it's difficult to difficult to pin down what you'd call it somewhere between like dream theater and muse used to was mm. like my my first band but then I, i essentially joined an indie band playing the bass uh and that was that was great fun but we also started a band when i was at university because uh my university was split into 37 or so different individual colleges and mm. they would all have their individual balls so they throw these big parties and there'd be you know multiple basically every single term uh And they always need bands to play. And so we mm. threw together a little band where we just played covers of pop songs. Yeah, yeah. And I think we did them quite well. Like it was good fun, but it was the easiest thing in the world. You know, yeah. it was just a, just a bit of fun, but it meant that we got to go to all these balls for free. So exactly. we, we kind of started it on the, on, on the motivation of trying to get into as many free parties as possible. And that was quite a success too. Well done. Mm. <laughs> yeah, I, I also used to play in like a heavy metal band um, for some years. So yeah. Do you, do you still play music or like is like music any part of your life now? Or? Yeah, I mean, it, it's never it's never not going to be. Yeah. Uh, it's very important to me. It's one of the skills that I'm most glad that I developed was an ability to play the guitar to some degree. Mm. Um, and I sometimes write songs and release music on secondary YouTube channels and things like this. Like it's out there, it exists, oh. but I don't I don't really cool. push it. Because I find it quite cringeworthy when somebody who's known yeah. for doing something else decides that, oh, they're going to do the music thing. It's yeah, it's often mm. hor horrifically embarrassing. Mm. But because I've already got things out there, it doesn't feel as radical to sometimes yeah. drop something. Yeah, makes sense. Kind of same. Or like a, yeah. yeah. Mm. Okay, looking forward to play together. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say we should, uh, we should jam. Yeah. I think there's a band tonight, so maybe we can... Um, yeah, we can just hijack. Yeah, I'm sure we can manage it. <laughs> Not really regarding embarrassing things because it's not really embarrassing, but we both have something which I know some people think could be like, yeah, like weird to talk about in some way. Uh, oh, this is an interesting way of leading into this, but um, it's just Patreon. What do you think about Patreon? Because like I, I have several friends um, who are like trying to go like full time activism or they're like creating some type of value and they're kind of like struggling a little bit financially or. Uh, they're like considering Patreon as less like one way to have an income, basically just yeah giving people the opportunity to support you uh, with money. Yeah, like what do you think about that? And like, and I'm also thinking like, 
Patreon versus running ads. Mm. Uh, kind of like thoughts around that. And I also know like people who have Patreon, but they also run ads and they also do like sponsorships and so on. Yeah. Like just some thoughts around that. Like I'm also, I'm thinking that I want to do this podcast thing without any, like here's the ads of this podcast kind of, but it could be that I will do it. So like, I'm not sure. Mm. But, well, there are lots of yeah. different strategies. I, I think anybody considering starting Patreon should do it. I remember when I mm. first had the idea and I wasn't really sure about it. It felt strange asking people to give me money for free content. But when I set it up, I realized that people are enthusiastic to do so if they think that you're providing value and you offer things in return for Patreon support. You can offer, you know, private live streams and early access to videos and this kind of thing. And people are often glad to have that. But a lot of the time, if somebody would sign up and I would tell them that I, that I, I used to offer like video calls, for instance, and I might say to somebody, look, I'm, I'm really sorry, I'm too busy at the moment. And they said, look, it's, it's fine. I, I I wasn't even thinking about that. It's not about the reward. They just like to support what you're doing. Yeah. If you're doing something that people care about, they want an opportunity to support you. And so I'm incredibly grateful to my patrons because without them, um, I wouldn't be able to do what I'm doing, especially with mm. how Powerful. I would try to put out content that was quality and, and infrequent. You know, I wasn't putting out daily content. Now that I'm full time, I might be able to start doing something like that. Mm. And if it got to the point where I was making enough money from ad revenue to not have to worry about bills and things, then maybe I would turn off the Patreon or at least focus mm. on it less. Uh, but for now, you know, it's, it's absolutely crucial. And it's part of this community building aspect of being online. It's a great thing about running a YouTube channel or something. It's mm. unlike traditional media, you feel a lot more connected to the people that you're uh, speaking to. Mm. And so I definitely recommend that people do it. Ads, ads are annoying. Nobody likes, uh, ads but sponsorships can be valuable if you're sponsored by companies that you like yeah uh and also i think people are kind of used to it um ads on videos and stuff are definitely things that you should be considering for a lot of podcasts i think what people do is they'll sponsor the audio versions but not the video versions so there'll be sponsorship deals that people will do where you listen on spotify you'll hear mm -hmm. at the beginning this episode is brought to you by this company mm -hmm. and maybe this company and this company as well and they mm -hmm. stick it at the beginning of the the podcast and then they get into the conversation mm. whereas if you watch the video version online the ads don't exist mm. uh, that's quite a common tactic to not bombard people with advertisements too okay yeah i think as long as your motivation for any kind of way of making money from your content is due to the fact that you're providing value and you want to monetize it that's fine if it comes across that you're just using every opportunity you possibly can to make as much money as possible mm. that's where things start to get a little bit cheap, I think, and you should mm. avoid that. Have you had any difficult choices or like actions, dilemmas lately? Difficult choices or dilemmas? Like thinking about what you're going to do in life, maybe, or... Oh yeah, certainly. Um, certainly in terms of, in terms of my, my job, mm. it's difficult to know where I want to go. I want to do more podcasting. So I want to launch a new podcast, but there's questions about whether to launch it on the current channel, whether to set up a new dedicated platform, what mm. to call it, how to how regular to do it, what kind of guests to have on. You know, do I want to continue with this cosmic skeptic name? Mm. I mean, I, I like it. I'm grateful for it. It's my channel. But can I be, you know, 43 and still calling myself cosmic skeptic? Probably yeah. not. So maybe I need to be thinking about a rebrand. But what if I rebrand and people don't recognize my name and, and my views go down and then I'm not making enough money to, to be able to pay rent and do it full time and I have mm -hmm. to get another job. And yeah, so a lot of stuff to think about like that. But it's a good position to be in. There are worse problems to have. So I'm constantly rethinking what I'm going to do. I want to do more writing. Where am I going to do it? Do I have mm -hmm. a website? Do I start a sub stack? You know, kind of stuff. It's, it's, it's all over the place. But these are difficult decisions that I'm lucky to be having to make. Yeah. Or, or you don't have a book yet? No, no yeah. book. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but are you thinking of having one? I must write one at some point, but yeah. I feel like I'm glad people listen to me and I, I enjoy the thought of people potentially getting value from my video essays and, mm. and this kind of thing. But it, it feels almost wrong of me to write a book because who am I to write a book? I guess anybody mm. can say that, but I want to make sure that I'm confident in my views and have something particularly important to say mm. even something i care very deeply about like factory farming yeah, if, if i 
wrote a book a year or two ago being like, this is why you should stop eating animal products. What happens if, it, if I then become of the opinion that the best way to tackle factory farming is an industrial approach rather than one based on individual actions and it's actually not immoral to eat animal products? Mm. What, what do I do then? You know, it's already yeah. in print. So I want to, I feel like I've got a lot more exploring to do before I'm willing to put my thoughts down on paper yeah. properly. But that's why one of the best ways I think to to start writing and start writing about philosophy is to write uh, fiction, is to write a novel or to write a dialogue at the very least. Mm. The ancient philosophers um, and yeah, more recent philosophers as well, people like David Hume would, would write in dialogue form and they did it because they recognized this is one of the best ways to engage in philosophy. Mm. It's supposed to be something that's done in conversation. Writing is supposed to be a record of things that are thought and done. It's not supposed to be a substitute for it. This is why Socrates never wrote anything down. He was against writing because he thought it made people lazy. If you've got something written down, you think, well, I've, I've got it on this sheet here. I don't need to practice it or remember it or uh, try to learn it by heart because if I need it, it's there in the book. But then you just never revisit the book and the, mm. the thought's gone. Uh, and so it's supposed to be about conversation. And so that's often captured in dialogues. And what you can do if you write something, this is why I've, I've considered a few times maybe trying to put my thoughts down into a, some kind of novel with characters representing different views that are floating around in my head because you can get away with presenting a view that you think might be true, but you're not going to be held to it because you put it in the mouth of a fictional character. Mm. And then another character comes along and criticizes it. And that's not a character that you've invented to be a devil's advocate, as it were, but it's, it's another part of yourself. It's, it's your own self-doubt saying, ah, but maybe mm. this is the case. And so these various characters represent different parts of the author's own mind. That's another thing Dostoevsky is very good at. The characters represent not... If you read like, you know, Galileo was thrown in prison because he wrote a book that was, was technically in dialogue form, but was very clearly advocating a position. It was clear which character was, was Galileo's own voice. And that's why the Pope had told him that he shouldn't be advocating for heliocentrism. And he said, well, I'm not advocating for it. I've presented a dialogue where people are debating it. But it was very clear what, what the opinion was. Whereas if you read Dostoevsky, it's very difficult to determine which one is the author, oh, right? It's, yeah. it's, uh, now, sometimes it's clear which one is uh, the author's most sympathetic to. Dostoevsky yeah. referred to Alyosha as the hero of the Brothers Karamazov, so okay. I guess he sees himself mostly in that character. Mm. But if you think Ivan Karamazov, the sort of atheist skeptic, is supposed to be some kind of, is supposed to be just based on other people that Dostoevsky had met, then I think you're grossly mistaken. I think this is a representation of that own part of his own brain which harbors those thoughts and those doubts. Mm -hmm. And so when it comes to writing, I think that writing a novel is a, is a great way to get these thoughts out on paper because you're not committed to taking a particular stand and standing by it. You can actually explore the ideas in real time through the mouths of these characters. And then uh, to another form of communicating like that, do you have any thoughts around like if you would like to see like one documentary uh, like the making of a documentary happen? Like, are there like some topics out there you think, which you're like, oh damn, like we really need somebody to make a documentary about this? I'm sure that there have already been documentaries made, but I don't know if I'm aware of like a, a big one, like the big Netflix one that everybody mentions, the go-to one, but I think we could do with one on pornography. I think mm. we could do with a documentary about not just the, the, the industry itself, and its ties to sex trafficking and assault, but also the effect of the consumption of pornography on the brain, particularly of young men. Mm. Uh, this is something that you know, people, people talk about a, a fair amount, certainly in the self-help and podcasting space, people yeah. comes up every now and again, but I can't think of a go-to documentary about it. It's not, it's not to say that we should be of the opinion that it's this horrible evil, um, but the more I learn about pornography, the more I'm becoming convinced that it's, um, let's say, detrimental and i think mm. we could do with a with a bit of a consciousness raising on that particular topic yeah. it's something that a lot of people don't like to talk about uh it, it's it's strange it's it's almost a little bit taboo because everybody's watched porn at some point right but nobody mm. nobody really talks like that it's why like if you if somebody when you first hear that you know part of the reason why the internet was invented and was successful was because of pornography you know people go their eyebrows raise for a second and then they go, mm. oh, well, no, do you know what, that, that makes sense. Because mm. everybody understands just like how, how popular this is and, and, and yeah. how regularly it's used. 
but it's like we're all just playing this game of who can pretend that that's not what's happening. Mm. I mean, some videos on these websites have hundreds of millions of views, hundreds of millions of views. Mm. If you see a YouTube video with hundreds of millions of views, it might be like a Justin Bieber music video or something. Mm. That the kind of things which on YouTube, like Mr. Beast videos, hundreds of millions of views. Like, this is the level of popularity we're talking about mm. with pornography. And sometimes it's probably the same kind of age groups that are watching it, but we, we talk about it as if it's this sort of small industry that some people sometimes engage with no it's mm. like it, it's it's more popular than mr beast is you know yeah. it's this is this yeah. is huge and i think we could definitely do with a documentary exploring its problems and its effect on the uh, on yeah. young brains interesting yeah i don't know if any one yeah if people do they can let us know mm. yeah we we'll probably find out okay so in one of the organizations uh, i run we are trying to stop norway uh, from like doing whaling uh, so basically, like Norway is one out of three countries which still hunts whale. Uh, Norway actually kills the most whales in the world. So that's like one thing. And another thing I just learned recently, which is kind of in the similar way, is that, uh, you know, lobsters, mm. <laughs> they are like the last 90 years, the lobsters in Norway have decreased by 92%. And um, so now like some people are talking about like maybe we should also, like, not only, like, ban whaling, but also maybe, like, ban, uh, like, the hunt of lobsters and so on. So, yeah, this is basically what I'm working a little bit with right now. So I'm just wondering, do you have any, like, thoughts around, I guess, like, protecting species uh, mm. or, like, doing that type of work? It's strange uh, how sentimental people get about the extinction of species. Uh, for me, I care about animal suffering. I don't think species matter intrinsically. Like, I don't think it's a great tragedy that, the, that dodos no longer exist. It's a tragedy in the sense that it might have been cool to see one, you know. Mm. But I don't think it's like bad for the dodos that they don't exist anymore, except in an mm. evolutionary sense. Yeah, it's bad that individual animals suffer, but just the extinction of species is not harmful in and of itself, except for maybe its effect on the broader ecosystem. But that's a separate question. Yeah, and so I find it strange that people are so willing to be sentimental about the decline in species, but so unwilling to be sentimental about the suffering of animals. You mm. talk to them about forcing pigs into gas chambers, it's like, ah, I guess it's the circle of life. But if you talk to people about, you know, the numbers of giraffes declining globally, it's, it's this great, horrible tragedy. Yeah. It shows that people are caring about animals, not for the sake of the animals, but essentially for the sake of themselves. We don't want mm. lobsters to go extinct, because then how are we going to eat lobsters? You know, we oh, don't want yeah. whales to go extinct, because they're beautiful, and I like the thought of them swimming around in our oceans. It's mm. not for the sake of them. If it were for the sake of them, we wouldn't be caring about the species level, but the, but the suffering individually. Um, mm. From an environmental or ecosystem perspective, I think yeah. it's a, a noble goal. But I think we should always be keeping the suffering in mind. I, I don't think, in other words, that it's a bad thing for a species to go extinct of its own accord. Mm. Wow, that's actually really interesting. Mental health and philosophy are written down. Mm. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, man, I mean, I w I'm trying to also remember where that came from. <laughs> I, 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 I mean, the, the, these are two different subjects. Of course, they're they're sometimes connected. Uh, people underestimate the effect that worldview can have on on the way that you perceive the world. I I do sometimes think that philosophy is the result of a person's let's say mental state rather than the other way around you know if you read arthur schopenhauer and he's writing about how the world is suffused with suffering and that suffering is the defining quality of the human experience like was he a bit depressed because of that philosophy or did he have that philosophy because he was a bit depressed mm. it's actually quite hard to know but there's clearly a link, uh, a link that goes one way or the other i'm suspicious of the the idea that human beings are rational in the sense that i think they they rationalize they feel a particular way they have an emotional reaction to the world and then they try to rationalize it through philosophy that's why people say i really like this philosopher you know i oh i i, I really like schopenhauer i think he's so smart what that tends to mean is that schopenhauer has put his finger on an emotional state that you share with him and he's managed to put it into words in, in a way that you've never heard before I don't think many people who think that the world is really happy. If you meet, if you meet like a Christian who thinks that the world is 
I, I, I've met Christians and I've confronted them with the work of Schopenhauer, mm. but they think that the world is designed and it's designed for the good of humanity and that love is at the basis of it. And so you, you show them Schopenhauer and they think, well, he's just, I'm just unimpressed by this. I just don't think it's, I just don't think it's correct. Whereas if you find somebody who is a, a depressed nihilist and you show them Schopenhauer, they're likely to look at that and think, wow, you know, how smart this guy is, how brilliant this guy is. But, you know, our judgment of how smart a philosopher is, in other words, is not always due to genuinely engaging with their work and thinking, are they a smart thinker? But how much they've managed to resonate with what we essentially already think, we just haven't managed to put into words yet. Mm. So much of great philosophy is just translation of emotional states that people already have into words that they can resonate with, into words that they understand. This is why some of the greatest philosophers are those who are able to engage with and translate the works of previous philosophy, because you know, the real philosophy consists of the things between the lines. Uh, it's one of the reasons why when you, if you read Descartes or Hume or Plato, someone, anyone older than sort of 50 years ago, it's often said, oh, well, you need to understand the context in which they were writing to understand their thoughts. You need to sort of realize you need to know what language they were speaking you need to know what culture they lived in otherwise you're not going to be able to fully understand their work and that's true uh, because of the fact that sort of they're going to be using different words in a different way they're going to have a different understanding of what particular phrases mean and so much of great philosophy is just figuring out what is between the lines figuring out what the words are supposed to represent and finding ways to represent those thoughts in a modern language that people will understand um so when it comes to mental health and philosophy, a lot of people blame nihilistic thinking or atheistic thinking on for, for like people being depressed. I think a lot of the time it's simply the other way around. You know, I, I think that somebody who um, you, you see what I'm saying, like you're not a you're not depressed because you're a nihilist. You're a nihilist yeah. because you're depressed. Well, like, is that kind of like when you're listen to some songs for example like mm. sometimes you can be like oh man that like that's so sad while well, other people are like that's so beautiful mm. or like because it really depends on what's going on in your head yeah that's Is right that what you're trying yeah to, like, yeah kind of it, it's it's kind of a of course there will be philosophers who have genuinely original thought and times that you engage with people and you think this person is really smart but when somebody says oh, i really like this philosopher i think much of the time it's just because they've said something that they are already feeling and just put it into words that they resonate with mm. uh and so I think we need to pay attention when somebody, when somebody says that they're a nihilist, are they just sort of using a euphemism for trying to tell us that they're depressed? Can you explain uh, both nihilism and euth, the second word? Oh, euphemism. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know how you would say it in, in Norwegian. Um, <laughs> I, I guess... That would be so cool if you just like started to talk Norwegian to me now. <laughs> <laughs> Another... It's, I guess it, it has like a representational quality is what I mean to say that uh, nihilism is essentially the rejection of all principles and there are sort of different forms of nihilism. You get moral nihilism, which is the view that there are no ethical truths. You can have epistemological nihilism, that there's no way to know anything. Um, nihilism as a broad term should probably be understood as just the rejection of all principles, epistemic, moral um, all, all kind of principles are just rejected. It, it's, uh, you know, shares a root with the word annihilation, sort of nothingness. It's um, destructive in quality uh, and highly skeptical as well. Uh, and, but I think that a lot of the time when people say that they have this philosophical position, firstly, you know, they're not acting it out. This is one of Jordan Peterson's most famous observations. That's why he says that no one's really an atheist because no one lives like an atheist. I think what he means is no one lives like a nihilist. It may be true that atheism entails nihilism. That might be the case, but that's something that needs to be made clear. Mm. Um, it's like, okay, so you say that you don't believe in any moral principles. You know, you don't believe that there is any should component in the world. It's like, well, why do you get out of bed? Why do you eat breakfast? Why do you continue living? And maybe someone says, well, I don't know. I, I just sort of, yeah, you know, do it because I can't help but do it. What that means is that you're acting out. You're acting as if there are these should components. You're acting as if you should get out of bed, as if you should survive, as if you should extend your life. Even if you can't quite rationalize it, it's like somewhere inside you there's this drive. And so then maybe you finally, after sort of convincing yourself you're a nihilist because you can't quite rationalize the reasons you're getting out of bed, this is what I think happens with a lot of people with Jordan Peterson. Mm. Right? He comes along and he speaks to a 
bunch of disaffected young men. Mm. And a lot of the time they're sort of very nihilistic and they say that Jordan Peterson helps them to escape from their, uh, escape from their nihilism because Jordan Peterson points out, well, look, are you really a nihilist? Because you're not acting like one. Right? What are you acting out? You're acting out this religious narrative and mm. he gets a little bit dubious in my view on, on, on that point. But people think, wow, this Jordan Peterson guy is really smart. But this is the kind of thing I'm talking about. It's like already inside you was somewhere this kind of conviction that this nihilism that you'd rationalized in your brain mm. wasn't quite right because it doesn't, it sort of rubs up against the way that you actually interact with the world. And Jordan Peterson manages to put that into words and confront people with it. And they go, wow, this guy's really smart mm. just because he's resonating with something that they already believe. So I think that that's what I was sort of getting at earlier. Mm. But when I talk about nihilism as a euphemism, I think that a lot of the time somebody can just be a bit depressed mm. and then they try to rationalize that depression they try to uh, take away the agency of that depression by saying that it's due to a philosophical position that they just think is true they're not depressed oh, i'm not depressed because you know i'm oversleeping and eating unhealthily and i'm in a bad relationship and i don't have any friends no no, no. i'm i'm depressed because i'm a nihilist because i have this philosophical conviction that life is meaningless and so i don't bother making friends and i don't bother getting out of bed in the morning and stuff it's, okay, sure, but why don't you try it out and see if it still works? Why don't you try getting up in the morning and exercising and making lots of friends and acting as if nihilism is false and see if you still think it's false? Mm. And a lot of the time, people give up that view. Mm. Doesn't that tell us that our philosophical convictions are a result of our mental states rather than the other way around? And that might sort of delegitimize the entire uh, enterprise of philosophy, but I think it just betrays philosophy to essentially be a process of rationalizing emotional convictions that people already have, at least in many cases. Uh, so I, I guess I'm trying to talk around the subject of mental health and philosophy. There's certainly a connection, but I don't think it goes in the direction that people mm. often think it does. No, but that was like super interesting. So uh, yeah, I was really wondering like what you thought about it. So yeah, good answer, I'd say. Mm. Uh, but generally mental yeah. or, or mental health. Yeah. Uh, social media is mm. the problem. It is, it is the issue uh, mm. because the reason why people might get depressed or, or have negative mental health, let's say, to include things like anxiety, you know, historically speaking, you engage with a lot of people, you engage with your community throughout the history of humanity, and every now and again, something would happen that would make you depressed. Something would happen to your community. It would be like the community's news story. Maybe there's a fire in, you know, your local hut or whatever. Or, you know, maybe there's a flood and, you know, you can't grow your vegetables or whatever. And, and, and it makes you sad and depressed. And, okay, cool. And sometimes good things happen and sometimes bad things happen. Sometimes there's another member of the tribe who does the thing that you do, right? You're the cook, but now here's another talented cook. And now you're getting jealous and anxious that he might take your place. And these things occupy like a... A small part of your life. Social media is just taking these communities writ large. Now, your your tribe is is the entire globe. Right? Like anybody on the on the entire planet can come into immediate communication with you at any point. And so there is no shortage of people who will make you feel this way. Whereas before, you might be depressed because you know there's a there's a flood in in your local village and that happens maybe once every few years now every single day you open the news and there's some story that can make you depressed mm. every single day you can find it doesn't matter what you're doing it doesn't matter if you're a podcaster or a singer or a, or a chess enthusiast there will be someone better than you there just there just will be somewhere on planet earth there's going to be someone better than you and because social media allows these people to immediately come into your vicinity all the time and in fact are designed to make that happen. Mm. Because if you are a chess player, then these social media companies are going to pick up on that and they're going to start showing you people who are better than you all the time. And so you're going to get anxious. You're going to feel like you're not good enough. Mm. This is incredibly dis destructive, but there's not really much that can be done about it because it, it's not like, this isn't a product of social media. This is just a product of sociability right people get depressed and anxious when they socialize with other people and those people are better than them mm. and those people are uh, more successful than them are smarter than them are more good looking than them mm. this isn't something that's invented by social media this is something that already existed in the human psyche but it existed at a functional level because we only interacted with such people every now and again 
social media just extrapolates that problem. Mm. And so it's not something we can get rid of. We can't get rid of the idea of like, oh, stop comparing yourself to other people. No, that's what human beings do. That's never going to go away. But there's something deeply concerning about the way that social media catalyzes this. And I think the only way to escape it is to, to disengage, delete your Instagram account, stop using Twitter, or at least stop arguing with people on Twitter. Mm. You know, log out of YouTube, search for videos individually, and don't let the algorithm tell you what to watch all mm. the time. Like, it's really important that we disengage. Good one. What are future plans for Alex? Where, what are you going to do next? Not sure. I mean, I'm starting a podcast soon. Mm. Uh, I, I've already done a few podcast episodes just as the Cosmic Skeptic podcast. Yeah. But I want to set up a dedicated weekly podcast with more regular guests on a, on a separate dedicated channel. So depending on how that goes, that could become my main thing. Um, cool. I, I'm not really sure. It's like the next experiment for me. But I'd like to write a book at some point. Um, I'd like to continue making video essays and talking mm. to people and having interesting conversations. I'm quite relaxed about the future because, you know, five years ago, if you'd have told me that I'd end up being a vegan advocate, there's just no way I would have predicted that. Just absolutely no way I would have even seen it coming. Mm. And so who knows what I'll be doing in, in five years, but I'm looking forward to finding out. Any last uh, thoughts or anything? Uh, not that I can think of, man. I mean, I'm just... Uh, I'm I'm glad because I'm here to talk about uh, it's like a a vegan conference that we're at here together. Yeah, and you you invited me to do this podcast and and we've talked a little bit about animals and, and veganism. But I'm I'm glad that we've been been more broad because uh, yeah. I think it's it's important even when you make something your main thing or the main thing that you're focusing on at the moment to to remember that there are other things to talk about too. So. I'm glad that we've sort of covered a lot of different subject areas. <laughs> <laughs> Unreal. Thank you so much for being here. Um, really appreciate it. And I have so many um, like questions kind of that I want to like go and research and so on. And I guess people listening and watching will have that too. So thank you so, so much for taking time. Alex. Absolutely. Yeah. Good to be here. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for listening and watching to that first episode. Again, thanks to Alex as well. And to everybody uh, yeah, who have watched and listened, uh, if you have any feedback, uh, please let me know. And I've also decided that I will not run any ads on this podcast. So if you agree that that's a good thing or yeah, anyways, um, you can consider becoming a patron and donate a little bit if you want. Uh, but 100%, no worries. If not, um, the most important thing is to spread the awareness and talk about these topics um, with people to learn more. So yeah. But I, I will leave more information in the description so you can find out like how you can support this project if, if you want. But I will also, also leave all the links um, to the relevant like books we discussed or like the topics we talked about and so on. Uh, so yeah, um, thank you so much for listening and for watching and I hope you have a nice day. Hope to see you in the next episode, uh, which will be, by the way, with uh, Otto Barton m most likely which is about existential risk. So yeah, uh, make sure you follow the podcast wherever you want to follow it to make sure that you catch the next episode if you want to. Yes. <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Have a nice day.